describer can can narrate, you know, what what they're missing visually, and then also the tactile touch tours. And I I can talk more about North Carolina, but the North Carolina Art Museum this past um, Sunday had a sold out show for people who were blind, and they did a tactile sensory where they explored the art through other senses. Um, and let me do one more plug. Downtown Durham has got an um, – y'all were talking about Black Wall Street. There is uh, – you can call a cell phone number, and there is a description of the art pieces there. There's some amazing sculpture works if you, if you, you know, walk the history route on there. And you can read the plaque, but you can also touch a lot of that art, and there's a cell phone number you can call in. It's, it's literally a, a tour of downtown Durham of the artworks for people that are blind. So that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm just trying to tell people about. You know, a lot of older folks in Durham that, that were living that history may have lost their vision and they haven't been down there to see all those cool renovations they've done um, and trying to tell the story of that place. So we're like, you know, that's the idea that you, you wouldn't be able to enjoy that if you've lost your vision from glaucoma or something. Um, there, there's, there's people trying to think about that. How can we make this meaningful for everybody, including those with disabilities? Um, so that's what I, that's what we get excited about. And I love artists because <laughs> – a lot of this is just being creative. Um, what you were just saying, my art is very tactile. You just start thinking, well, how could I help somebody enjoy that? And artists are good about thinking differently, you know, and, and, and trying different things. And that didn't work, but let's try this. So I think it's why a really a powerful place that a marginalized community can find belonging and meaning. And that's, and that's just cool. That's awesome. Definitely. And all, for all four of you, I was just wondering – because I would think of all four of you as art advocates. So what kind of role do you think art plays in advocacy? And how did, how did you get involved in art as an advocacy tool? Because, like I said, you're definitely doing advocating for those with disabilities. I imagine you're also advocating for artists that have disabilities as well. And then definitely, as I mentioned in y'all's introduction, that's what I've always considered you, um, Telly, and I as being not just great artists and great performers, but y'all are also advocates in the community. And I've just met you online, Judy. But just how did you get involved in the advocacy part of it, and how important is that to you? And uh, – Let's see. We'll start off with we'll start off with the, uh, you, Aya, and then I'll work around roundtable wise. Um, yeah. So for me, um, it's about being responsive to community. Um, I am absolutely committed to whatever community is that I find myself in. And so when I first came to Durham, understanding where it was that I that I now was living was super important to me. And so whatever I do is going to be informed by that community and the needs of that community. Uh, both Kelly and I, we both started as um, part of our work was as teaching artists, and we worked for some of Durham's alternative school, like Bacon Street and um, Lakeview. And so we were working with kids um, who had all kinds of different labels and IEPs, and so we were really leveraging the arts there, like really um, utilizing multiple intelligences. So, you know, whether it was kinesthetic or auditory or visual or, you know, like, so I think that's kind of built into the way that we approach um, the arts in general. And what about you, Betsy? How did you get involved as an advocate for artists? And I don't know, are you an artist yourself of any um, means? No, I, I play one on TV. Ha ha. No, I am a recreation therapist. So I'll, my history, I love y'all talking about, you know, new people coming to Durham. Um, I started working in Durham Public School, Schools Special Ed in the 90s, um, and we would go, I did a lot of just recreation therapy in the special ed classrooms, but we started bringing groups to kids to the Durham Arts Council and doing um, residencies at the at the DAC then, um, and then we worked with a lot of teaching artists coming into the schools. So I just, I had worked in a lot of clinical settings, and more and more I just started thinking that the arts were really powerful and could really impact people with disabilities. So it just sort of led me to this organization. Um, and I, let me just shout out a minute. But, yeah, teaching artists going into schools, um, that's often a place when you get, you know, working with kids with disabilities in the school system, that's often their first exposure to something they can be really successful at, you know, or do well or find a passion. Or, you know, I might have trouble with learning or I might have trouble because I'm in this, you know, I've got behavior stuff. But the arts, when they start being successful, you have a really amazing opportunity to create, you know, change and hope and um, a more positive path for some of these kids. So thank you all for 
you know, doing that work and being open to all kinds of learners. Yeah, one of the things, and I want to hear from Kelly as well, but one of the things that I've always been amazed by is I have a good friend, Gary Messenger, who's a musician, but his son actually has autism, so they are very much involved with Bright Star, which is a stable, which is not necessarily using art, but they're using horse riding as a way to get these kids oh, engaged cool. and uh, in, involved in society, and that's right here in Durham. So I know I just saw a post on his on Facebook, I think it was yesterday or Saturday, where he had just gone on a ride with one of the horses out there at Bright Star, which is out in, like, the county part of Durham. Awesome. Kelly, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in art advocacy. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I like to think I like to think that, um, you know, we, you know, I started out. I, well, I grew up. My mother is a is a classically trained musician. She's a harpist, a pianist, and she sang opera. And so all of us grew up playing music. I grew up in a family band. The music was always around me. But um, as I got older and began to teach more, I realized that, you know, in Africa, the arts are, everything in, in, in the arts has a, a meaning, it has a purpose. It has a use in the society. And so <clears throat> there's the aesthetic part of art. It's beautiful. It can even be healing to look at or listen to or to partake or to participate in. Um, but also, you know, as I as I started to grow older, I started to see that the youth, you know, there's there's, there's something missing. And um, I recently received a fellowship about a year ago from uh, uh, Forward Promise, and this is for anyone working in the field, for leaders working in the field of um, healing for boys and young men of color. And um, I've I've grown a lot through this fellowship, with creating a cohort of 20 of us across the country, even through the in the Pacific Islands, who um, are dedicated to to this purpose. And so, um, uh, with the drumming, I've I've actually started a drumming school called the Magic of African Rhythm Drum Institute, and um, and my mission is to is to guide young children in in the um, in having a positive self image. I know that that is uh, uh, a piece that is that is that is heavily missing in our young people, uh, no matter what walk of life they come from. We are inundated with images of ourselves that are not coming from us. We're inundated with negative self images, and so I I struggle with that that's with, with what I what what I viewed from a child to this day, and so you know the, the my motto is the mastery of drum is the mastery of self, and really mastery of anything is mastery of self. But I've learned that through playing the drums, and I've observed this. With lots of lots of young people and adults, you 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 deal with challenges, and you know you deal with all of your personal issues as you get better and better with the instrument. The only thing that stops you is yourself, and so you have to you have to ultimately master yourself in order to master the instrument, and uh, and so. You know, when I think about the uses of the drum in the past and, and, and the uses of the drum on the continent of Africa, um, we need those uses back. You know, those those purposes for the drum are are what I'm trying to bring back and and, and instill in our youth because that's that's um I feel like that's that's a grounding thing that's gonna that's gonna um it's gonna it's gonna kind of galvanize and focus our youth going forward. And Betsy, that actually brings up an interesting question, which is that sometimes I mean, there are definitely disabilities that are there's no doubt that they exist and that they are plain as day and that we need to find ways to make sure that those people are accessible, um, whether that's vision issues like blindness and being wheelchair bound and things of that nature. But I do sometimes wonder if sometimes our education system doesn't get 
too caught up with the whole labels of disabilities and sometimes try to give people that label that might just be hyperactive. They, they may not necessarily be a, disabled, a disability. And I was just wondering if you ever have to face that when you're dealing with an advocate for the disabled, where some folks may be getting labeled a certain way, but they may just be carrying their family dynamics with them. Yeah, so that's a that's a great conversation, and you know because sometimes artists will say, "Don't you know you're putting a label on me, or you're you know this is." We're really respectful about people's identities and and what they want to you know talk about it or use it, but we also say that like labels are for food, canned food. Um, <laughs> I think labels help us organize information, and if you're trying to like reach out to people with autism or kids with autism, it is helpful to be clear but past that i mean the idea that you have to say this program is for kids with autism no that's that's really not the intention um and then i think labels are just helpful for information and planning but past that um the stigma of saying you know you have the disability you're xyz it's it's really more about being welcoming to all people and thinking about them as guests and what do your guests need so maybe your guests, you know, need um, physical access because they use a wheelchair, but that's just good for everybody. So it's it's a, it's an interesting thing when you get into marketing. Like people are like, what do I say? How do I talk about this? And it's really just, you know, be respectful, be courteous, um, but let people tell you what they need. Um, and and you know, not you don't have to create separate programs, but you make sure that you're putting out the message that everybody's welcome. If you have questions about accessibility and access, call us. Um, it's not about here's a program for kids with spina bifida. It's like here's a program, this is where it's being held, here's information for planning, and then call us if you have questions. Because um, there, there is stigma. Some, lots of times people don't want to tell you they have a disability because they're scared they're going to be excluded or you're going to, you know, think about them. I have one teaching artist, she's on my board, she says, I don't like to know anything. She goes, then I then I have prejudice and, you know, I've predetermined what they're going to be like. She goes, I want them just to come in my classroom and I'll kind of, you know, see what they need. And I think that's cool. I, I think it's very individualized how people want to be identified and be um, supported. Definitely. And uh, I uh, just, uh, it's a walking tour. And I know with walking tours, there's sometimes people that cannot always get around. So how do we deal with these folks that might have different disabilities if they're going on the walking tour? Because I know I went on the walking tour with you. It's not exactly a short walk. <laughs> no, it isn't. Um, and actually, I was hoping to connect with Betsy more about that, um, especially like for this Juneteenth celebration. Um, uh, you know, we're going to be walking, and it's not a long walk, but from Hay to um, downtown and the idea is it's for a community, for community to be reclaiming their neighborhood, reclaiming their history, and yet um, there are going to be folks in our community who are not going to be able to participate because they won't be able to do the walk. And so um, I was working with um, a group called Safe Routes to Parks to figure out, like, what are they talking about? How are they making um, these walkable routes accessible really for everyone. And so we did a community walk audit, um, kind of wanting Ooh. to identify a safe way for folks to walk from Haytag to Black Wall Street Gardens. Um, and so we began to identify looking at curbs and looking at um, the, how long the crossing lights are and the rails across, um, you know, the highway bridges and things of that nature. So I'm beginning to awaken to that. Um, I do not yet know how to make it um, accessible for folks who, you know, just don't have the same kind of mobility with their legs that I do. Um, we have a lot of elders who are intentionally getting out to walk, and we have some steep hills, and I do my best to encourage folks. But honestly, um, I don't yet have accommodations um on how to get around. Um, I know that sometimes we've had folks use a bus and they'll kind of, they'll get the route ahead of time and they'll meet us at the different stops. But um, I would like to see folks to be able to be really a part of the entire walk um, and figure out like, you know, what do we do? I'm, this is a perfect time for me to say, I would love for someone to invest in a, 
a trolley, a step-on-step 